Happy Easter. We are so glad that you are with us this morning. Welcome to TCBC. Especially if you are visiting um, with us, we want to extend a special welcome to you. You can find the order of our service and the text of all our readings and song lyrics um, today on, in our online bulletin at tcbc.cc connect. Um, and now if you're able to please stand with us, whether you're at home or on Zoom, and join us in our call to worship. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten thousands upon ten thousands. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Please stay standing and join us in musical worship. Well, good morning, church. It's so good to see you all. Happy Easter. Uh, you know, um, you know, there's many different ways you could celebrate Easter. Some people like to have a nice big brunch. Uh, some people like to have peeps. This is the one time of year where you might have peeps or deviled eggs. For me, that this is my time of year to have deviled eggs. But um, we are here for a different kind of purpose. It is uh, to gather with Christians around Champaign-Urbana and around the world to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. And for over two millennia, Christians have tried to capture this cosmic event, this miraculous, wondrous event through music and songs from many different genres and styles. So this morning, we want to invite you uh, in a medley of songs from different styles of the church. Um, you might call this the TCBC Easter Eras Tour. Um, uh, well, some of them might be super familiar to you. Some of them might be new to you. But they all have the same core message. Um, but you will have to buckle up a little bit because we're going to go through a bunch of songs really quickly. So um, are you guys ready? Yes. All right, here we go. Let's start in the 1700s here. Uh, this is a British hymn. You just heard it. Um, I'm sure Charles Wesley did not have a drum set, but if he did, I'm assuming it would sound exactly like this. Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah. All creation join to sing hallelujah. Let's sing this together. Christ the Lord is risen today, hallelujah. All creation joins to say, hallelujah. Raise your joys and triumphs high. Justify, leave me forever, and one day he's coming. 
crucified Free me forever One day he's coming back Glory will not stop is 
hope we have faith because Lord you came you lived you died you rose again and you're coming back Jesus we're here today because we believe that death does not have the final word what we see in our world what we experience in our lives does not have the final word we believe that after Good Friday, there's Easter Sunday, there's resurrection. After the cross, there is life. After suffering, after persecution, after death, after pain, after sickness, there is life. That's why we're here today. That's why we gather as the church around the world and throughout the ages to declare that at the end of all things, there is life. And Lord, we pray that your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven and as will one day be. So Jesus, we ask that you have your way in our service today, whether we feel so close to you this morning and are excited to be here, whether we are just not even sure where we're at, whether we're not even sure you exist and we were just dragged here by a friend or a family member. We pray, Lord, that you would meet us where we are this morning. And we pray, have your way. We offer the service to you and every element to you. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We pray all this in your strong and mighty name. Amen. So again, good morning. Happy Easter. He is risen. We again want to extend a warm welcome to all of you. If you're visiting for Easter, if this is your first time, we're so glad you're here. Um, if it is your first time, um, please make sure on your way out to stop in the foyer. We have water bottles for you um, with a little bit of information in there. We'd love you to grab one of those. Um, our mission at TCBC is to see campus and community transformed by Christ to renew the world. And I have a special connection. I feel like I've gotten to experience a lot of TCBC's mission. I came here um, as an undergrad for uh, three years. I was a global partner in Central Asia. Um, and now I'm here as a community member. 
So I can tell you in all of those contexts, TCBC has been a wonderful, warm, um, and safe uh, spiritual family. So if that mission um, intrigues you or interests you or excites you and you want to learn more, um, please go ahead and check out our website, tcbc.cc slash connect. Um, we also would love for everyone right now to fill out the connection card. You can do that online by scanning the QR code up on the screen or, again, going to tcbc.cc slash connect. Or there's a, for those of you who are like me and still like paper, there's a little yellow card in the pew in front of you. So whether you've been coming here since birth, whether you uh, are first uh, an, uh, visitor today, please take a moment to fill that out, and I'll just give you a couple seconds to do that. filling those out and just want to share with you a few um, additional ways that you can connect um, here at TCBC over the next few weeks. Next Sunday is our Baptism Sunday. That's always a really unique and special service as we hear um, the personal stories of members of our congregation who are choosing to be baptized, hearing how God has um, been pursuing them and at work in their life. So I encourage you to come back next Sunday for that. We will be back to our um, regular just one service at 9 o'clock. 10 o'clock. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. The church staff was like, no. <laughs> Um, following that, on Saturday, April 13th, we're going to have a uh, women's tea and retreat from 1 to 3 p.m. in the fellowship hall. So this is a chance for um, all of us to slow down from the hustle and kind of bustle of life and just have a little bit of space to be together um, as sisters in Christ. We're going to have some tea and hors d'oeuvres, and we're going to hear a wonderful message from Lynn Kincaid on the practice of silence and solitude. So whether that is something you practice regularly, whether that is something in that say your stage of life you crave, or whether those words make you want to run screaming from the room, I encourage you to come. I'm sure um, Lynn will have some encouragement for us. Please bring a Bible if you have one, and please do um, RSVP again at tcbc.cc slash connect um, so we can plan accordingly. And then the following Saturday, April 20th, the men get their turn with um, breakfast and conversations. This is for all ages, campus and community. Bring a friend, bring a family member. Um, again, please register ahead so apparently we can plan enough bacon. And being a nurse, I do have to tell you, everything is better with bacon except your cholesterol level. So um, just public service announcement there. All right, well, um, now I'm going to invite up Melissa to have a special um, kids moment. Good morning. I'm Melissa Egley. I'm your family ministry and outreach director. And I want to invite up all the kids um, aged up to fifth grade to come around me for a story. So, come on, come sit up here. If you d don't want to come alone, you can bring an adult. Kids of all ages, right? All right. So, all right. This story is, of course, about Jesus. All right, come on up. You can come closer. All right. Now, Jesus knew he was going to die and that it was going to be no ordinary death. We call the day he died Good Friday, and it was good, very good. Okay, it's, I'm going to talk, okay, Caleb? We would say it was unbelievably good, except that it happened and we should believe it. Jesus suffered so that we could be set free. Jesus died so that we can live forever. Jesus was the good shepherd, laying down his life for his sheep. And that's why we call it Good Friday. But for anybody who loves Jesus, that Friday seemed anything but good. It must have seemed to the disciples like it was Sad Friday, or Tragic Friday, or the worst Friday in the whole world. 
But there he was, Jesus the Christ, hanging from a cross. The sky went black because it was a day of judgment, and Jesus cried out to heaven for help. There was a time to feel the curse of the law, not the smile of God. Jesus had become sin for us. He breathed his last, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. The disciples were scared and confused, and the world was dark and sad, and everything seemed wrong. Now, Jesus knew he was going to die, but he also knew that he wasn't going to stay dead. So Friday was really dark and sad, and Saturday was silent. But Sunday, the third day, was not just any other day. It was another age. A new time had begun. The biggest story had turned a page. The world would never be the same. At the break of day, Mary Magdalene and a group of women went to the tomb. They thought they would find Jesus there and put perfume on his dead body. What they found there was a complete surprise. On the outside of the tomb, the stone had been rolled away. And on the inside of the tomb, there was no Jesus. <laughs> the women wondered what this meant. But before they could think about it for very long, two angels, as bright as the sun, stood by them. Why do you seek the living among the dead, the angels asked. Jesus is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Then the women remembered that Jesus had said that he would be raised on the third day. They had not understood what this meant, but now they did. The serpent had not won after all. Death had been defeated. The wages of sin had been paid for. Mary and the other women ran back to tell the disciples what they had seen and heard. At first, the disciples didn't believe them. A dead man come back to life? That's a fairy tale. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb to see for himself. When he arrived at the tomb, he was amazed. Peter hurried into the tomb and found nothing but grave clothes. Jesus wouldn't be needing those anymore. He wasn't dead any longer, and he wouldn't ever be dead again. In the days and weeks ahead, Jesus appeared to the disciples several times. In a room um, along the road, on the beach making breakfast, he even appeared to more than 500 of his followers at one time, God raised Jesus from the dead, and plenty of people saw him with, his own, with their own eyes. The light of the world is still shining. The bread of life is still alive. The true vine is the first fruits of a new hope. It turned out the best news in the history of the world is too good not to be true. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. God, for the resurrection and the new life we have in Jesus. I thank you for each and every child here today and pray you'd shine light in their life, Lord, that you would lead them every day and um, lead them in, to where you want them to go along your path. Lord, I just thank you that we have your resurrection as our hope in this life. In your name, amen. All right, I need everybody to stand up for me, please. All right. All right, guys. So you guys can stay seated if you want. All the kids. So today, I'm going to give you a balloon, and we're going to release them to show that we rise, like we will one day rise with Jesus in his resurrection. So you will get a balloon later to keep. Parents, bring your kids to me after service, and they can get a balloon to take home. But these balloons we're going to let go, okay? Yeah. All right, yeah, we're going to let them go. All right, so let's give the balloons out. All right. Come on over. Come on in, Amanda. Amanda, just come over. To start handing them out. What color did you want? 
purple? Here, we got a couple more. Here, did you want purple? Okay. All right, does everybody have a balloon? All right. All right, let's have our helpers go back. All right, kids. One, two, three. He is risen indeed. Let go. Yeah. Let go. All right. All right. I'm going to, oh. A couple of them don't want to rise. <laughs> we'll keep those. <laughs> All right, all the kids can miss to their kids' classes. And I want to introduce Sandy Lou for congregational prayer. Happy Easter. <laughs> Again this morning, as a part of our um, congregational prayer, we'll have a time of response. I will say, we have hope because, and you will respond with, Jesus has risen. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we do rejoice today that you love the world so much that you sent your one and only son to suffer and die on the cross. And today, today we celebrate the next part of the story, his resurrection. We have hope because, God, you are worthy of our praise. It's your power that conquered death, and it's your grace that changes us and invites us to be a part of your family. We have hope because, Jesus, you are worthy of our praise and thanksgiving. You gave your life to pay the debt for our sin. We have hope because we confess that like the disciple Peter, our intentions to be fully committed to you often go astray. We deny you in thoughts, in words, and actions. Forgive us and draw us near to you so that we may withstand temptation. We have hope because, God, by your power, we are made like him, and like him we rise. Ours the cross, the grave, the skies. In times of pain and suffering brought on by illness, accidents, wars, disasters, for the many we know personally and around the world who are suffering, we look to the cross where you, Jesus, endured pain and suffering. And we have hope. We have hope because in the times we feel alone and misunderstood, when our prayers seem to stick in our throats, for those we know who struggle with loneliness, alienation, or mental illness, we look to the grave where you knew separation, and we have hope because for those who are grieving the loss of loved ones, we look to the skies, for that's where you are, Jesus, seated, seated at the right hand of our Father, and we have hope because thank you, Lord, for Greg and Becca Salvo, our missionaries of the week. We praise you for leading them in their mobilization work with GEM, Greater European Missions. May their hearts hunger for more of you, even as they rest in your goodness and faithfulness. Guide them in their work and in their parenting of their nine-month-old Eden. We thank you for Pastor Brian and the time that you have spent with him studying and praying over this passage in 1 Peter. May our pastor's words be your words, and may our ears be open and our hearts be receptive to the teaching you have for us today. In all things, 
we have hope because amen thank you sandy lou good morning everyone happy easter he is risen my name is Brian Scott. I'm the lead pastor here at Twin City Bible Church. It's my honor to bring God's word to you today. Uh, we are in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. If you have a pew Bible, that's on page 588. While you're returning, I'll say a quick word of prayer. It'll, the words will also be on the screen. Father, we thank you for this Resurrection Sunday. Lord, we come with expectation. Uh, we come with anticipation, or perhaps we're just here, but we ask now, God, that you would remove distractions, Lord, that we could hear with ears to hear what you have to say, in Jesus' name, amen. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses, or chapter 1, rather, verses 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is God's word. Is the resurrection ho-hum? Is, is it just a cultural phenomenon where we gather around ham or pot roast or whatever inflation doesn't prevent us from having, and peeps and Cadbury eggs? Uh, you see, because, well, at least for Hollywood, besides the cultural phenomenon of Barbenheimer, Barbie and Oppenheimer, Things aren't looking so good with, with box office sales. People, the audiences have said, well, these stories are beginning to be ho-hum for us. We'd rather not go. Is the resurrection story like that, too? I mean, we've been talking about it for 2,000 years. Does it get old? Not the way that Peter is talking about it here. You see, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the one story that could revolutionize your life, that can change your world to bring something that you deeply desire but is so elusive in this world, hope and joy. The things that your heart desires, the resurrection provides a way for you to have in Jesus Christ. How do we get them? How do we get hope and joy? How do we possess them? What does the resurrection have to do with it? It's all here in this text. So today's message you could entitle, Christ's Resurrection Brings Hope and Joy. Christ's Resurrection Brings Hope and Joy. There's three things you have to know, Peter is saying, in order to receive hope and joy. You, it's what you must know about the past, number one. It's what you must know about the future, number two. And what you must know about the present. What you, the, the, the past, the future, the present. Let's think about the past. Okay, verse 3 says this. Peter, he talks about the resurrection as the means by which, the grounds by which God allows you to be born again through faith to this living hope. And, and so there's two realities that you have to know here. One, there is the objective reality. And secondly, there's the personal reality. Well, what's the objective reality? Well, the objective reality is this. Peter is an eyewitness to the risen Christ, and he is speaking of the resurrection as a historical event, verifiable. This actually happened. happened. It's objective. And when you look at, for example, the, 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 the studies, the readings of ancient Jewish 
uh, believers and even of pagan readings, nobody has a concept, it is not entered into anyone's mind that God would become a man, would die on the cross and would be raised from the dead. That's, that's not, that's, there's nothing there. In fact, if you think about what the gospel accounts say, uh, Luke's gospel accounts, for example, his, his says that the, the women, they went to the tomb, they're looking for a dead, man, a dead Jesus to um, put spices and things on him, and then the tomb is empty, and then the angel says, he's risen, he's not here, and go tell his brothers and his, his followers, and, and so they go and they tell the followers, and it says that the disciples thought of this as an idle tale, that Jesus would be risen. There is nothing in their worldview and their perspective that would lead them to conclude, even though Jesus said it many times over and over, I'm going to rise and I'm going to die, I'm going to rise on the third day. There was nothing there. The only, the only plausible explanation for why the gospel accounts would say he rose is because, in fact, he did. That's the historical reality or the, the objective reality, but here's the personal one. You see, Peter says, in order for you to receive the benefit of the resurrection, in order for God to do a miraculous work in your life of being born again, you have to see it as God's mercy. You see that? Verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the vehicle of which the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This is how you get the personal reality. You have to see it as mercy. Now, what is mercy? Well, over spring break, I traveled with my youngest son, who's six years old, to North Carolina. And to come back, we were having to leave the Greensboro Airport, the first flight out, and so we got up at Central Time, 4 a.m. That sounds like fun. And so I wake my son up, and we, we get up, and my brother, we, we go to the airport, don't really have breakfast, we get on the plane, we fly to Chicago, we sit on the tarmac, and we wait for our gate to be cleared. And then the time, that we, the time between uh, the landing of the airplane and us retrieving our car in the parking was an hour and a half. Yeah, that's a long time. And so then we get to the car and we are driving through an hour's worth of Chicago traffic because at this point it's the tail end of rush hour to get to where we were going to pick up some Lou Malnati's for uh, dinner later for the family. And I go to Starbucks to get uh, coffee and some actual breakfast. Lo and behold, they have this, uh, you know, uh, pastry, and I order the pastry. And the pastry, they said, sorry, sir, we, you know what? I just found out we ran out. And so I'm like, okay, well, let me get a, uh, you have breakfast sandwiches? Can I have one of those? Well, I see it's more. I had already paid. And they were like, oh, sure. So they get me the breakfast sandwich, and they're like, you know what? Don't worry about it. You don't have to pay the extra. And so for me, that was, that was a little mercy because all the, the, the six hours that I've been awake at this point, you know, early rise, you know, security at the airport, waiting for a long time, traffic, all these things. I'm paying all the, the things, you know, by time. But here the Starbucks barista says, you're okay. You're good. You don't pay full price. That's a little mercy. But what is great mercy? Well, see, here's the thing. For many people... Maybe, you, maybe this is your concept of God's mercy. For many people, they think, well, you know, I'm not that bad off. I just need a little help. I'm just a little confused. I need direction from God. You know, I need a little strength. I, I, I feel weak and tired and I'm, 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 I'm weighed down by life. I just need a little push from God. I just, need, I just need a little bit of help. I'm not that bad off. I mean, we live in central Illinois, after all. I mean, there's, you know, life here is, is relatively good, relatively easy. We're comfortable. We're not like those urban people, you know. We're not cutthroat. We're not, uh, we, you know, drug lords aren't running our town. I mean, we are in good standing as citizens. We just need a little extra help. And then as you receive that help from God, you're like, okay, God, I will be thankful for that help. But here's the thing. That's not great mercy, and by the way, if that's your understanding of mercy, it's not going to lead you to have hope that endures all things and joy in the face of suffering. What is great mercy? Well, you see, what Peter refers to and what Scripture teaches, the great mercy of God, it changes how you view yourself and it changes how you view what God has done and what you experience 
in the, in the magnitude and the kind of love he demonstrated for you in Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. What is great mercy? Well, great mercy says this. The scripture says this plainly. Without Jesus Christ, you have no hope. You are without hope and without God, without Jesus Christ. That's what it says. And in fact, it says, Scripture says this. It says that you are dead in your sin and an enemy with God. You say, well, that sounds extreme. How can that be? Well, here's the thing about sin and the sinful nature and a sinful heart. A sinful heart will do a couple things. One, it will do anything it can to deny its existence. That's not me. I'm not like that. I'm, not, I'm, a, I'm a good person. I'm moral. But the other thing that it does, a sinful heart does, and we all have one, it'll find a way to view itself as better than other people, other categories of people. Well, I'm not as bad as those people. Now, we may not have the greatest expressions of evil in Champaign-Urbana. You may not be, you know, a, a great evil person in a, in a, in a moral relative sense, we may not be as cutthroat as city people, but let me ask you this. Are you any less prone to, make, to justify your life by your possessions? Are you any less prone to find your identity in a relationship, either with a romantic relationship, a child, a spouse? Are you any less prone as a student to be uh, achievement-driven? Are you any less prone than a student at, you know, a private school, uh, at an Ivy League school to be achievement-driven? Are, are, are we any less prone to find everything and anything to worship, to be the center of our life, to, be, to have, to justify our lives? You see, the reality is what Scripture says, we need great mercy. We are all without hope because, because you and I, we are idolaters. We find these other things to justify our life. Sin isn't just all the bad things that we do. Sin is finding something else besides God to live for and to worship. And you and I have all, we've done that. And therefore, as a result, we're on a collision course. Without Jesus Christ, you're on a collision course with God's wrath without Jesus Christ. And as a result, the only hope that you have is that God would send his son to stand in the way. You're, you, without Jesus Christ, you're on a locomotive whose terminal point is God's wrath, unless Jesus Christ comes and stands in the way. Now, how does he do that? He, he's not like Spider-Man who comes or Superman who comes and pushes the train. It's not with great strength. It was with great weakness. He was crushed, the scripture says, for your iniquities. And it's as you realize that, as you receive that, that's great mercy. You see that the death, burial, and Jesus, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ was great mercy. So you got, you have to know that. You have to know the past. But you can't just under, you can't just know this about the past. You have to understand if you're going to have joy in the face of suffering, if you're going to have hope that endures anything, you must understand something about the future. Is what Peter says here. Our second point. There's two assurances that he gives us in, in verses 4 and 5. Two dual assurances, things that you can count on. They go hand in hand. Both must be present in order for you to understand and, and be assured about the future. The first one he, he says here in verse 4, he talks about an inheritance. And he says, that it's in, he says three things about it. It's imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Now, what are those? What is, what is imperishable? undefiled and unfading. Well, let me give you an example by way of contrast. So two weeks ago, my car was, was well, it was been making, it had been making all these popping noises when I turned the wheel. And it's the thing, you know, of course, I want to ignore that. But until eventually, it's like, okay, this is a real thing. And so I take it in, and, uh, and then first, the, the mechanic says, okay, you got you to gotta get your struts and your shocks replaced. Have you ever had struts and shocks replaced? That is not cheap. Oh, my goodness. There was a sticker shock. And so then I talked to Becca. Okay, we'll do, okay here's my arm and leg. You can do it. Um, and so then after he does it, I go pick it up, and I bring it home, and then I turn my wheel, and I hear boop, 
and or it was it was a little lower tones. But I'm like, uh, I think I still hear a popping noise. And then I'm trying to talk to, but I, I kind of feel like it's still popping. So then she's like, well, you trust your instincts. Take it back. I take it back. Well, it's your ball bearings. Okay, wait, wait a minute. And so, so then that the sticker gets higher. And so then, okay, we, we can't get it to it today. Leave it here over the weekend. I leave it there on the weekend. Monday morning, oh, we're done. Here, one thing, um, when you come, we need to check your car out because, well, there were thieves who came over the weekend and they broke into several cars and we need to make sure everything is there. Okay, so I check the car. I thought everything was there. Well, actually, so the thieves, they did break into my car. It was locked. And there was a pile of masks, you know, you remember COVID. And so I had a bunch of those. And then uh, they took, they stole my gum because, you know, criminals need fresh breath. And uh, they stole my change, you know, when you go to Aldi, you need the quarter. I didn't have that, so they, they must shop at Aldi. Um, but then I, uh, I noticed they took all of the masks out. They left two masks in the bottom, and they're the ones that Becca made back during the beginning of the pandemic. They're both Yankees masks. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure they are Cardinals fans. <laughs> but in that experience... It reminded me, this car is perishable. In fact, all I own is perishable. All that you own, all that you have is perishing. It's all fading. It could all be defiled. It could be vandalized. Your identity could be stolen. Your passwords could be stolen. It's all of those things. All of life is is those things. But the inheritance that God has for you is imperishable. It's undefiled. It isn't fading. What is it? It's the fullness of your salvation. It is the fact that one day when Jesus returns, you will be raised with him. And he will create a new heavens and a new earth. That's what you have to know about the future. But it's not just that you need to know that. It's just, it is that you need to know he is preserving it for you. It, there is nothing that can tamper with it. And, and in fact, it's the, the inheritance, by the way, is, it's more like an ancient inheritance than it is a modern inheritance. Do you know the difference? You see, in a modern inheritance, your Aunt May may have written you into her will. But you don't really know that until after she passes. And then it gets divvied out and you find out, oh, you know, I inherited a piano or whatever it is. But you don't know it until after the person, per- after they perish, after they die. But in the ancient times, you would know the inheritance before the, the person died. You think of the parable of the two sons, the, the prodigal son, it's more familiarly known as. The younger son asked for the father, hey, can you give me the inheritance that's coming to me? It was a known reality. And, and, and Peter is saying, we know, we have understanding of what the inheritance is. It's the fullness of the salvation of what is coming for us. It is, and as one, but, and, and, and here's the thing. We have to understand what, where, we're, what, what's headed, where we're headed. The, the inheritance is kept in heaven for us, but that's not where we receive the inheritance. We receive the inheritance when Jesus comes back to renew the earth. And, and here's the thing. For many of you, maybe you have a view of the afterlife that basically accounts, amounts to Jesus having struck a deal with death, maybe getting a settlement from death by, here's, here's what I mean. If you view that the afterlife is, all it boils down to is a disembodiment of our souls in a life eternally in heaven, disembodied. By the way, that's not what scripture teaches. That's just our intermediary stage. There's a second point in the horizon. When Jesus returns, he is bringing all of physical reality renewed. And you see, if our existence for all of eternity was just to be disembodied, then Jesus just got a settlement with death. He didn't actually defeat it. Your body would stay dead, right? But if he defeated death, that means even though you lose your earthly This body, as you presently have it, one day you're going to get a better one, one that is incorruptible, one that won't fade, one that's imperishable. 
That's what he's bringing. And as wonderful as all of that is, if God could preserve that for you, but somehow your life, you could spoil and throw it all away and reject your faith and leave God behind, you wouldn't be able to enjoy it. And so Peter promises this in verse 5. He says, you are being protected. You are being guarded. You are being kept. The inheritance is being kept for you. You are being kept. You who are by God's power being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. He's keeping you. Now, he's keeping you through faith. It's not automatic. You have to, you have to trust. You have to keep pursuing. You have to keep following him. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. 100% Christ, 100% you. His grace working in you, his salvation working in you, you working out your salvation, as Paul says, with fear and trembling. You have to guard your heart. heart. You have to honor God. You have to live in a way that honors him. But he's keeping you. He's keeping the inheritance for you. He's preserving it. It's going to be it's going to be awesome, but he's also keeping you. So you have to know that about your future. If you're going to have hope in this world, if you're going to have joy, you got to know that. So you got to know the past. You got to know the future. But here's the present. Here's the reality. In verse 6, Peter says, here's how you have to respond. In fact, actually, he tells us three things that you need to know about the present. Number one, how do you respond to suffering? Secondly, what is the purpose of suffering? And then lastly, the union of suffering. Let's consider the response to suffering. What does he say in verse 6? He says this, in this you rejoice. In what? In everything that he's just said. In everything about the past and everything about the future, you rejoice in the face of suffering, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. How do you respond to suffering? What does the resurrection say about how you should respond to suffering? Well, consider this. Buddhism says this. Buddhism says life is suffering, avoid it at all cost. You need to, the, the, the way you overcome suffering is you detach emotionally. Hinduism says this. Suffering is just, if you, if you say, well, why am I going through this? Why, why is this all this happening to me? Hinduism would just say, well, it's, it's a result of how you lived in a former life. You just, suffering means you better do a better job this time. Uh, Western culture, our modern Western culture says this about suffering. It says, well, it's harmful and it's trauma. And it basically says, our culture basically says, just when suffering comes, particularly if it comes from a person, wave the magic wand to make it go away. If a person causes you to suffer, what does our culture say? Well, get rid of them. Cancel them. Censor them. Keep them from talking. Keep them from speaking. Ghost them. Just get, just get them out of your life. Effectively, what we say is, rain, rain, go away, come again another day. That's how we treat suffering. But what is the resurrection's response to suffering? You can have joy. How is that possible? In fact, one objection to Christianity is, how could there be a good and all-powerful God if there's so much suffering in the world? Well, underneath that objection is this, is this thought. Here's the thought. If I can't understand how something good could come out of this evil, then it must be purposeless. That's, that's the thought behind the objection, right? But here's the thing. Consider Good Friday. Consider Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ lived a perfectly, not only moral life, but perfectly obedient life. He perfectly obeyed his father. He did good in the earth. He taught many people. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He delivered people from demons. He did all these miracles. But on Good Friday, those who were closest to him abandoned him. One of those who was closest to him betrayed him. He suffered a dishonoring, ignominious death of a violent criminal. And even for a moment... It seemed even that Satan had claimed victory over him. You could look at this and, and categorize it. This was the greatest injustice 
done to any human being, the greatest evil committed against any human being, that would be what we could say, you could say that about Good Friday. How, and so here's what you might say looking, if you were there, if you were present on Good Friday, you might say, how could anything good come out of this evil? You see, you could say that until Sunday, until the resurrection. And here's the thing, if God had the power to take the greatest injustice the greatest evil, the greatest human suffering ever done and could redeem it by his resurrection power, what could he do with your suffering? What can he do for you? That's why you can have joy. Not because you're sadistic, but because Jesus Christ walked the earth and even in the presence of the joy of others, he was always sipping the cup of suffering, and one day he would down that cup on Good Friday. But then he rose again so that you who believe in him, who trust in him, who hope in him, as you go through the sorrows of this world, you can sip the cup of joy because one day you're going to down that cup when he returns. That's the response to suffering. And what's the purpose of suffering? Well, Peter says this in verse 7. He says that the purpose of suffering is to test your faith. It's actually to make you stronger. God allows um, hardships, trials. He even allows Satan at times to tempt you, to test you for the purpose of strengthening you so that it would result in praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You, you, well, why does God do that? Well, we, he does that because of this. He does that because... When Jesus returns, we could look at God and say, he was able to keep all of his people through everything that life threw at them. And he can look at you and say, you were able to hold on no matter what life threw at you. And it results in praise and glory and honor. But finally, there's the union of suffering. And what do I mean by that? Well, the scripture teaches us Jesus Christ suffered not just indicatively. He suffered for you. He was crushed for you. He was bruised for you. There's union. He did that for you. He experienced it for you. It, he paid the price for you. He offered mercy for you. He suffered for you. But not only does he suffer for you, the scripture teaches us, teaches us that as you suffer, you can enter into fellowship with him. You don't suffer for Jesus, but you can fellowship with Jesus in your suffering. But even more than that, so that's union. He suffered for you. When you suffer, you are entering into fellowship with him. But even more than that, when you suffer, when you go through hardship, when you go through medical trial, financial hardship, or whatever the case is, relational strain, Jesus enters into to that. He enters in that suffering with you. He gives you grace and mercy in the moment. He himself comes to your aid. That's why what Peter says in verse 8 is true. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. You see, what he's saying is this. If you know the mercy of God, if you know how desperate you were, and if you know that you were headed on a railroad collision course with God's wrath, but Jesus stood in the way because of his great love, because of the love of the Father, if you know that, and if you know that there's the inheritance, the assurance, the fullness of your salvation is coming for you when he returns, it's being kept for you. If you know the future, if you know the past, and if you know that when you're in, enduring suffering in this present life, that Jesus Christ is there with you, he's shown you that all suffering can be redeemed, but he's present with you in your suffering. He invites you to fellowship within, with him in your suffering. If you know all of those things, you believe all of those things, if you've experienced all of those things, then of course, though you don't see him, you will love him. 
And though you don't see him now, you will have joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. And you will receive, as it says, we receive in verse 9, obtaining the, uh, the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. If you want living hope, if you want a faith that can endure anything, if you want joy in the presence of suffering, here's what you have to do. You have to know those things, but you have to do something. You have to receive his mercy. You have to receive God's mercy for you in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. That that wasn't just a historical event, but that's a personal reality made for you here and now. You have, to, you have to adopt that as your life, as a core, as the thing that animates your life. That's what you have to do. You have to know the past. You have to know the future. You have to know what is true about the present in light of the resurrection, and you have to receive his mercy. Maybe you've wandered away. Jesus is inviting you back. Maybe you never knew him. Jesus is calling you to himself. If you receive Jesus, he'll come in. He'll revolutionize your life. He'll do all of this for you if you let him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your great mercy in sending Jesus to die, to be buried, to be raised. And this morning, I pray that that would not just simply be a historical reality, that Easter would not be a cultural phenomenon of, of, of gatherings and food. Those, those are good things. But Lord, let this be a personal reality, the thing that animates our lives, that makes us come alive, that we experience all of the benefits of being born again and having living hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's a couple of reflection questions for you. When you examine your life, is there evidence of hope and joy in you in the face of present suffering? On this Resurrection Sunday, do you have genuine faith in Jesus Christ? And if so, or if not, do you want to be found having it when he returns? So we will continue to respond through worship and prayer and the giving of our tithes and offerings. We have uh, many opportunities for prayer throughout the week, so please make sure um, to take advantage of those. And we will have two shepherds available after the service if you would like to pray with one of them today. Ushers will be coming forward to collect offerings. There's also other ways to give listed on the screen behind me. Um, you can also place any of the yellow connection cards um, in the plates. Feel free to um, add any questions um, about or comments um, about the service today there. Um, after the ushers have come by, please join us in singing. And as we sing this song, I uh, want to invite you to think about a place in your life where you're hoping for a resurrection, for new life, a place that might feel dead, broken, where the hope of resurrection that Pastor Brian just preached about that God might want to speak into. So as you, as you listen to this song, as you sing along with us, 
uh, may the hope of the resurrection become real uh, for each of us. The hair that once was crowned with thorns is now with glory now. The Savior knelt to watch our feet. Now at his feet we bow. The one who wore our sin and shame, now robed in majesty, the radiance of perfect love now shines for all to see. Oh, your name, your name is victory. All things will rise to Christ our your name, your name is victory. All praise will rise to Christ our King. The fear that held us now gives way. The fear that held us now gives way to him who is our peace. His final breath upon the cross is now alive in me. Your name, your name. Ashes of defeat, the resurrected King is resurrecting me. In your name I come alive to declare your victory. The resurrected King is risen. By your Spirit, by your Spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. In your name I come alive to declare your victory. The resurrected King is resurrected. The resurrected. The resurrected King is resurrected. tomb where soldiers watched in vain was borrowed for three days his body there would not remain our God has robbed the
As we leave from this place, let's go believing that our God is the King of Kings. Let's sing this together. It's our last song.
thank you all for being here this Resurrection Sunday. It's been wonderful to worship with you. I want to remind you parents that uh, as you are heading out of the sanctuary to remember to get your kids, take them with you. Uh, that'll help our, our children's ministry. And the other thing is we do have another service coming, so um, we love for you to fellowship, but to try to do that in an expeditious fashion to make space for the next group of folks. Now, receive the benediction. It comes from Hebrews chapter 13. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us, that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's sing the doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Go in peace and have a happy Easter.